what the new normal for operations is, we decided it was time to bite the bullet and attempt a virtual AGM. Uh, so thank you for participating in this experiment. Uh, I do want to go over a couple of kind of technical considerations and ground rules to try and make the meeting run as smoothly as possible. We have Jenica and Mary Jane who will help to control things like muting people's uh, audio and controlling screens as is possible. Uh, but if everyone could take a moment to put themselves on mute and also to turn off their video if they're currently using video, that'll just help to keep things running a little more smoothly. And later on when we're outside of presentations, uh, the audio can be flipped back on in the case of questions and discussion. Uh, if anyone is having a, kind of technical issues on the way, you can send us a message in the chat box and we'll do our best to help figure things out. I can't make any great promises. Um, and, and also, if you have any general questions that you hope that we can address during the meeting, uh, please feel free to message those either. Um, you can choose the participant that you want to message directly, or you can type them into like the everyone chat box option. Okay. Uh, so as Mary Jane will share with you in a few moments, it's continued to be a challenging year in achieving the full vision of the MCFC. Uh, but despite some of the roadblocks that we're working to overcome, there have been several important steps forward made, which have including, included signing a letter of authority that's supporting the development of our campground business uh, and some pretty significant administrative work that's helped to form the Nova Scotia Working Woodlands Trust. And tonight we're actually doing a kind of co-AGM. So after the presentation for the MCFC, we're going to transition over to a meeting uh, more focused on the land trust. So we hope that everyone here is going to stay tuned for both of those portions. Um, and one of the most exciting developments from this year has been the addition of a second staff member to our team. So we are so fortunate to have Jenica Hunsinger, who has joined us as our ecologically, ecological forestry coordinator. Uh, Jenica brings two years of experience working with us as a summer intern, in addition to the work that she's done developing a biodiversity, I should say, a baseline biodiversity assessment for our land base as part of her Master's of Forestry Conservation. And now that she has graduated, we have snatched her up and are so happy to have that internal human resource support. Um, I think without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Jane, who's going to provide some updates about highlights from the past year and a half uh, before we move into the more formal business meeting for the MCFC. So Mary Jane, it's all yours now. Thanks, Katie, for the intro. Um, so as, as Katie mentioned, I'm going to start tonight um, with some key updates from the community forest, uh, and then we're going to go into our business meeting. We are going to hold a bit of a break around 7.30. I'm hoping that this meeting won't take uh, as long as what we're anticipating, likely chance it won't, um, and then we'll move into uh, the Nova Scotia Working Woodlands Trust key updates and then the business meeting for that as well. So to start off from the Medway Community Forest um, with our negotiations. So as many of you know, we hold a 15,000 hectare crown land license area license agreement with the Department of Lands and Forestry. Um, we've held that since 2015 when we initially signed as a pilot project agreement um, to kind of test community forestry as an alternative to traditional crown land management. So that pilot project agreement expired in 2018, uh, at which time we signed a one-year extension agreement. So that's in order for us to keep operating on our Crown license area. Following the signing of that extension, we began facilitated discussions between the department and key members of the MCFC board to lay the foundations for success in negotiation. Um, at times there's been some Differing opinions between the department and the MCFC board. So it was important um, that we establish kind of a level playing field as we went into these negotiations. So, oops, I have this twice, but we signed that one year extension agreement. 
Uh, and then we negotiate a team terms of reference um, between the department and the MCFC um, to really initiate uh, productive conversations. Um, so that was in 2018, it is now 2020. Um, so we've actually signed another one year extension agreement. And in March, 2020, we actually decided to sign a three year extension agreement. Part of these delays are from um, the implementation of the Leahy review. And although this is generally quite a positive thing, um, it is a, quite an undertaking for the department to uh, do on their end. So therefore they're not signing any new long-term agreements um, before that time. Sorry, I just have to admit someone into the meeting. <laughs> it's not working very well. For me. Apologies, I'm going to have to leave the presentation to do this, I suppose. Um, hey, Mary Jane, just a quick uh, Zoom trick for future. You can make Jenica a co host and yeah, then she can is. manage the participants uh, while you present. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, waiting they've all been let in okay okay Jenica I didn't hear from you that you were doing that so that is great all right no worries. yeah I'll keep letting people in as they come it makes me nervous when I see the <laughs> the cursor that people need to get let in all right so um where was I so uh we signed a three-year extension agreement this year um and basically that's will enable us to kind of continue to operate as is and kind of move into this role as a demonstration force for the department. Um, it's important to recognize that uh, the whole outlook from the beginning of the MCFC is that we would become a self-sustaining entity um, and we would actually generate revenue for the local community. Um, without a long-term agreement, it's pretty hard to for us to do that and then also just generally implementing some of the findings that we found during the pilot phase. Um, so we're in the process of negotiating what constitutes um, a successful community forest for the future and we're hoping that in this time we can uh, achieve an agreement that are, are mutually beneficial for both parties. So Part of entering an agreement as a demonstration for us with the department is we negotiated ongoing funding um, and we needed to definitely prove that we had some sort of directional strategy um, and business plan in order to move forward in this next three years. Um, so they kind of fell under five main, five or six main umbrellas, um, economics and operations. So ensuring that our license area is managed as a working forest. Um, so continuing to operate and cut wood on the MCFC. Um, and then we also wanna work to develop new wood product markets and market under opportunities for underutilized species. Um, we wanna to continue to enable direct community investment and support through community and, go and governance and develop an active and meaningful engagement strategy with local Mi'kmaq communities and Cam Cano. So for us, that's really just continuing to build relationships with local indigenous communities. In our multiple value stream, um, we'd like to develop a long-term recreational strategy with our local stakeholders and establish the infrastructure for a multi-use trail system, accommodations and or backcountry reservation system. Next is our environmental umbrella. Um, so we, Katie spoke a bit earlier about Jenica undertaking a baseline data collection of uh, biodiversity within the license area, which we'll hear about a bit later. And then we'd like to modify our interim management plan, which was originally introduced in 2016 to align with the new Crown Land Forest Stewardship Plans, which have yet to be released, but as we've been told um, are currently, uh, or will be going through stakeholder review very soon. In terms of research, we would like to assist the Department of Lands and Forestry in helping achieve or some of their learning objectives related to ecological forestry and specifically establish a research committee 
with academic and government representatives that can help um, identify key research priorities for us in the next three years. Finally, um, in our stream of private woodlot services, we'd like to develop, continue to develop the Nova Scotia Working Woodlands Trust um, and establish several working forest easements um, within the community. So I talked a bit about funding. Uh, the Department of Lands and Forestry has given us funding for the past, since the end of our pilot project agreement in 2018. So that first was a one-year funding agreement to develop a five-year business plan. And then in 2019, we entered another one-year funding agreement to cover the amendment and overhead while negotiating a long-term agreement. And now we're currently negotiating funding for the first year of our three-year agreement. Um, so we've asked to be considered for um, multi-year funding, but unfortunately that's something that the department doesn't readily provide um, based on reporting needs and requirements associated with their budgets. Um, so we may only get a one-year funding agreement, but at least we've kind of established a baseline of what we, we'd like to be doing for the next three years. We do get funding from several other sources. Um, should should just lay out for those of you who are new to the community forest that um, we are a for-profit cooperative, um, but because we don't yet have this structure to be self-sufficient, um, that will require quite a bit of negotiations from the department. Um, we're continuing to pull funding from other sources. So uh, we've gotten several different funding specific to employment, um, which has been part of why we've been able to hire on Jenica as a full-time staffer. Um, so Project Learning Tree, Eco Canada, Canada Summer Jobs, and the Nova Scotia Labor and Advanced Education Department, specifically the Graduate to Opportunity Program. We also received some trail funding from Nova Scotia Communities, Culture and Heritage. Last year, our AGM, we held the trail opening on the Four Mile Stillwater Trail. That's been open for over a year now and well enjoyed by many in the community. Um, we've also received funding for tree planting from Forest Recovery Canada, and we've also applied um, and received the $40,000 Canada Emergency Business Account loan um, due to COVID-19. Jenica, I have someone that's waiting to be admitted. I don't know if you see them. It's a phone number. Yeah, so uh, I let them in, but I guess it's not notifying you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's Thanks. all good. All right, to start on some of the fun stuff, um, our, our first kind of uh, key project we've been working on over the last year has been recreation, specifically the development of a campground. Um, so this is a campground facility that's walk-in access. Um, it provides some of the kind of backcountry um, feel, but with relatively easy access. So this Google Maps shows kind of the generally where it's located. It's located on Lower Stave Lake, um, which is within 10 minutes of Highway 8 and kind of conveniently located like nearly squarely in between Kedgy and Annapolis Royal. So to zoom in a bit, um, you can see kind of where we're nearby Lake Monroe, View Lake, Lake Torment. So the, the Toby Attic would be what is bordering us um, to the south and uh, to the west. Uh, and then there's a private land parcel in there as well. So we're specifically looking to develop a 12 site campground. Um, at this point, um, as Katie mentioned, we have um, received a draft letter of authority from the Department of Lands and Forestry. This is a really new thing for them. Um, typically, they're used to land uses that are pretty straightforward, um, like forestry, uh, that initiating any kind of different land use, especially when it involves erecting structures, uh, prevents some presents some bureaucratic challenges. Um, so we haven't yet signed the letter of authority, but we're in active negotiations um, regarding those terms. And I think we've come to a conclusion that um, suits both parties. So we're looking forward to hopefully developing this over the winter. 
probably not all 11 sites, um, but maybe looking at a pilot of six for the first year, but really establishing the infrastructure that's needed um, to kind of get the project going. So with the campground, um, we also wanted to create some amenities that draw people to the area. So although we'll kind of be endorsing the day, daytime visits to Kedji, um, there will be some uh, trail infrastructure developed uh, in order to get people out and exploring on the community forest. Um, so the pink trail on this map has actually ended up being removed uh, from our proposal, the private landowner um, at, at one point was on the fence, but ultimately decided that he, um, due to uh, his use, he didn't really want people accessing uh, across his, his land, um, which is perfectly fine. Um, but the other trails we have are um, specifically through a beautiful old forest, which is that um, dark, that green shaded polygon there um, and we think will be uh, very enjoyable as well as providing some access to Lake Torment and the Toby Attic for people who are more ambitious and maybe wanting to um, take their canoe out. So as I mentioned, we're hoping to sign that letter of authority with the department in the fall um, and actually complete an in-person consultation. Uh, we do have the date here as November 8th, um, though that conflicts with the second Sunday of regular season hunting. So we might be changing that to the following weekend. So that would be November 15th. Um, so just keep your eyes out on social media specifically um, for uh, specific dates for that. Um, we would really encourage anyone, if you know users of that area, um, specifically hunters or anyone else who might be implicated. I mean, mind you, this is a summer campground. Well, it will be open year round, but, um, you know, we want to be aware of possible conflicts before they arise. So it would be great if you could share it with the wider community. Um, and then following that consult, we will also day have a 30 day online consult as well for people who don't make it out in person. Um, we will be releasing an RFP for construction. We're hoping to have some additional funding come through um, in order to pay for the development of the campground because we really would like to make a nice facility that lasts and, and that will require significant investment. It is a walk-in campground. We're not looking to develop, you know, gravel trails that anyone could drive an ATV down. Um, so it is meant to be, you know, rustic, um, but, but we also have to consider safety and having proper um, clearances for fires and uh, picnic tables and outhouses and all of that stuff. So it, it will be an investment. Um, and then of course, invite contractors to bid on road upgrades and parking lot construction. So going into the winter, we hope to start this um, work on the campground um, and do some of our road upgrades and outhouse construction. So now I'm going to give it to Jenica to talk a bit about research. Perfect. All right. Um, before I take off and share a little bit about the research that we're working on right now, um, I guess I'll just say hi. Hey, everyone um, to who I haven't met. And thanks, Katie, for the lovely introduction. Um, and also, I just wanted to point out that if you have questions at any time throughout any of this meeting, um, we're going to have time for questions later on. So feel free to just jot down any questions you have in the chat box, and then we'll have a break and, and have some time to answer through them. So if there's anything that Mary Jane has just said that you have some questions about, just feel free to, to drop those in the chat box and then same going forward. So um, will you flip the slide there, Mary Jane, and we'll dive in. So since we do have some positive detections of hemlock lily adelgid in Southwest Nova, um, the Medway Community Forest Co-op is working in collaboration with various partners, um, including um, MTRI and the Canadian Forest Services, as well as Kedji, um, and working with private woodlot owners 
So firstly, uh, in 2019, um, MCSC created an operational silvicultural plan for the Jeremy's Bay Campground at Kedji. And more recently, um, we've been working with those various partners um, to test um, silvicultural trials that involve thinning to reduce stand density um, in stands that have a high percentage of hemlock. Um, with the goal to slow the spread of the invasive and monitor these sample plots over time. So in the last few months, um, it's been a bit more recent action. We've been setting up paired plots um, that involve one hectare uh, areas um, where the pair we have a control um, to monitor the changes over time in our study. And this is sort of done in reference to some work that's been done in the Eastern US since they have had experience with HWA in the last decade. Um, and yeah, so the goal to thin those stands um, in preparation for increased HWA invasion um, as a part of an integrated approach to reduce um, the hemlock's vulnerability to the attack. So these plots are being set up both on crown land and private land across various counties and so far mostly in Lunenburg and Annapolis and a little bit in Queens as well. So um, some more research, um, I'll have Mary Jane flip. Yeah. Um, so Mary Jane did mention the baseline biodiversity study and um, that work was launched in the summer of 2019. Um, and so a ton of data was collected across the MCFC license area that was hosted in 25 sample plots, permanent sample plots, um, with the intention to reevaluate um, this data and recollect every five years. So the study objective here was to provide an assessment of the effects of harvest operations on stand structure and population distribution trends over time where these findings uh, inform our management to promote the regeneration and restore natural conditions of our Acadian forest. So you can see um, this chart is a little, um, it's, full, it's full of all checks, but <laughs> it's laid out so you see our, our study focused um, took place in four dominant tree species stands. So we looked at black spruce and red maple, red spruce and white pine as well as looking in an area that had been burned in 2016. And we looked at five key indicators of forest health, and that included downed woody debris, snag densities, the understory vegetation, and we also surveyed mammal populations and bird species abundance. So we do continue to monitor breeding birds um, through our annual spring um, point count surveys. And so we conducted our second year um, this spring. And in that, um, we do 10 minute point count surveys um, twice uh, at each of those 25 plots. Um, so we can capture the full um, spring um, and make sure that we're, we're able to see what happens um, throughout the spring as different birds come through different times. Um, with this, uh, we are, sort of flagging and indicating where we are seeing species at risk. Um, and this year we had four separate detections of our olive salad flycatchers and three um, detections of eastern wood peewee. So looking at um, the results here, we found that birds are most abundant in our older forests and through ongoing bird monitoring and collaborative work with forest bird researchers we're working to develop best management practices that ensure habitat for birds are preserved and promoting operations that maintain and increase habitat suitability. I think that there's some more details about the, the chart here um, that we could get into, but there's um, so there's a good sort of overview on our website that's been shared if you ever wanted to dive into any of those details there, but we compared the downwoody debris abundances um, with some ecological reserve data from Maine. Um, and so where we're seeing these checks, um, either the green for passing or the red X's for failing, it's sort of based against this um, benchmark as a minimum threshold. And that's 
based off of various um, research standards, as well as with looking at that ecological data um, from Maine for the downwardy debris. So happy to chat more about it later, but I think that's a pretty good summary of what we're seeing here. Um, I guess I'll point out too that we did detect um, pine marten um, on our license area, which is exciting because they were extirpated from the area in the 80s and reintroduced um, into Kedji. Um, so great to see that we have some of these species on our license area and that we can work to promote habitat suitability for them. Thanks so much, Jenica. Of course. Okay, next is our outreach update. And I kind of struggle to what year to talk about, but we're going to talk a bit about 2020 because um, that was the interesting year. Um, so this summer we hosted two webinar series. Uh, we one, an intro to the forest series aimed for the general public, and one series meant for forest professionals. Uh, they were very well attended. We had over 50 participants register for the most popular webinars. Um, obviously, kind of towards the end, we, we hosted about like 12 webinars or something. So we, we kind of had participation piddle off a bit at the end, but two of our most popular ones, Dale Press and, oh, Sorry, Bob Seymour, especially, um, were, were very well attended and they can all be seen on the MCFC YouTube channel. Um, if anyone is interested, we recorded all of them. Another really key um, kind of innovative way to take uh, outreach to the virtual level was the development of an ArcGIS story map. And we had a great intern this summer, Hiba Girar, who was very skilled, is very skilled in um, ArcGIS. And, and she's she's been able to put together this website that showcases the multiple values of the license area with a wider public audience. It's not yet public. Um, it still has to go under, well, it still has to be finished. Some finishing touches are left to do. Um, but then it also has to go through stakeholder review before we make it public. But I can give you a quick demo here, if it loads. Um, so this is a really great platform to sh kind of tell the story of the MTFC um, and showcase on maps what we're actually doing. Um, so something that's specifically I know will be of interest to a lot of people is um, our harvest prescriptions. So we actually show on the map all of the areas that we've harvested in the past and how they've been harvested. So we go through, give a little bit of a description on each of them, and then actually identify those polygons that have been harvested that way. And then you can actually click on that harvest and see a photo of it. So as I said, um, the site's not completely finished, but we will have some data on species at risk habitats. Um, I'm just gonna bug you for a sec, Mary Jane, your screen's black, so I'm not sure if we lost you. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> oh I know what's going screen on. Maybe. I'm going to have to share screen again. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. It's exciting to see the, the map viewers, though. Just suspense of a black screen. Yeah, right. Um, all right. Let's go back into there. You can go away. OK. This should work now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're able to see the web browser. All right, so everything I just said repeated. <laughs> um, so yeah, as I said, this, this shows a map and the specific treatment types of harvest within the license area. Give it a second just to load here and then um, yeah, you can actually scroll through, see selection harvest, patch cuts, and then actually click on individual polygons, see a photo of what that harvest looks like. 
Um, and then we also have um, been working on species at risk habitat. So not actually sharing specific locations or detections of species at risk, um, but showing where they might be found, where there might be super suitable habitat um, for those species. Um, so here, still not complete. Anyways, it will be great once it's done um, and is a really interesting initiative. So we will be happy to share that with everyone soon. So to finish off here, um, just to give a brief operations update, um, this year has been quite slow for operations for us. Um, we've been told there's uh, some limitations on contractor capacity. Um, obviously, the closure of Northern Pulp has had some impact, but we're specifically mostly operating in, in the harvest we did do this year was in a sugar maple stand and this photo um, shows what it looks like now. Um, and we were generally quite happy with how the harvest was executed. Um, we did utilize tree marking, um, which is something we do for our selection harvest. We don't always do it for our shelter cuts, but for our selection harvest when we're marking about 25 to 30% removal um, and actually marking individual trees to take out. It does add productivity for the operator. They don't need to make the decisions themselves on um, what trees to remove. And sorry, my partner. <laughs> um, he's just grabbing some potatoes for dinner. Um, you know, they're curing in my office. Um, so anyways, on our Facebook page, I did a whole kind of COVID series on tree marking um, and what it is. And it was really well received with a lot of the people um, who engage regularly with our page. I tried to explain it in a way that um, is comprehensible for the regular public. Um, go through things like what we see on the right here, mossy top fungus, and why that has to be removed um, from maple stands. So I hope you check it out. Uh, and then also, I hope that we can get wood cut at some point this year, and we're working on it. I'm working on it regularly. Um, so fingers crossed. So now we'll take any questions from the chat, Jenica will read them out and I'll try my best to answer it. Sorry about all of the technical issues. I'm sure the land trust presentation will go so much more smoothly. All right, yeah, if anyone else has any questions that they wanted to add into the chat box, there is, um, someone asked, will there be any opportunities to volunteer with the construction of the camp area clearing? Yeah, for sure. Um, we'll definitely be looking for people who have some certification with Chainsaw. Um, our insurance does cover that, but you need to have some certification if that's what you're talking about. Um, yeah, so we will need we will need help, and we will be reaching out. So just make sure you're um, tied to our mailing list, and I'm sure if you knew about the HM, you will know when we're looking for volunteers, yeah. And that's all for questions that have been dropped in here so far. I think Minga asked one about the biodiversity study, but I think I covered that, just sort of what those benchmark, um, yeah, it's the minimum threshold for um, biodiversity in the Acadian forest based off various sources. <laughs> Okay, I guess if there's no more questions, we can move on to the business meeting. We had one just come in um, asking if there are any examples how, of how the new Crown Land Forest Stewardship Plans might alter the MCFC plans. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we, we went through an extensive process to establish our forest management plan. Um, and it was based on, 
we use the existing crown uh, land plan for the Medway district, um, which is the crown land management district that we're within. Um, we use that as a baseline and then added, um, added details primarily through a precautionary principle that reflected our stakeholder and shareholder values. Um, some of you may have been involved in that process. Uh, and it was extensive though, in, you know, it, it, it was nearly five years from now. So we would be due for a refresh anyways. Um, but hopefully we're, you know, our special management practices that we've created as a community forest, such as our silent season for migratory birds, that we won't be changing that, um, that kind of thing. Um, anything that's on a precautionary scale, obviously abiding from all of the minimum um, special management practices that the Crown outlines, um, but uh, generally it's seen as, as positive if we, if we implement our own. Um, so wait and see on that one, but good question. Maybe to add, like when we looked at what the outcomes of the Leahy review were, they're well aligned with the types of principles and decision-making that went into our management plan. So I think at least personally, like I anticipate that uh, it, it won't have any substantial negative impacts on the way that we do our operations. Um, and if anything, it's kind of align the the things we're hoping to work towards and what's happening on Crown Land elsewhere in the province. Yeah. Uh, any tips for people who want to get chainsaw certified? Uh, I don't know who's doing chainsaw certification now, but if you're in the South Shore, the Harrison Lewis Center um, does chainsaw training. And I think if you're in the Valley, um, the Nova, the Forest Safety Society. Uh, they talk to Al Agrignon. Al Agrignon, exactly. Yeah. Is a good contact. Yeah. I can, I can get you his number, Craig. <laughs> Um, so I think with that, we can transition into the formal business meeting. Um, so we are going to make this kind of quick and dirty, and we'll start with the approval of the 2019 AGM minutes, uh, which Mary Jane has graciously posted up here. Uh, so everyone can read on their own accord Mary Jane, did we want to verbally deliver this as well? Um, up to you, Katie. <laughs> I'll, in order to buy people a few minutes to read through the minutes, I'll talk through the highlights. They're going to kind of give you an exact layout of what we're about to do with this business meeting. Uh, so approval of the 2018 minutes. Uh, we approved any new members uh, who would have purchased shareholders over the year prior, the election of new board members, uh, and then a presentation of the financial report. All of the motions were moved and accepted. And that sums up last year's AGM. So I think with that, I will call, and actually here I should kind of, um, set some guidelines for how we can do a virtual AGM uh, because it's in some ways easier and others uh, a little harder to keep track of if you're the secretary. Uh, but anyone who is a member or a shareholder of the organization is welcome to vote on any of the motions that are made this evening. Uh, and we will take motions uh, by having people both type into the chat box uh, or you can also raise your hand uh, using the raise hand icon. I, you probably need your participants tab opened up in order to see that option. Um, and then when we call for voting on a motion, if you under the reactions option, it's a smiley face with a plus sign coming out of its forehead, usually on the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can give us a thumbs up if you are agreeing to whatever statement I'm making. So either uh, opposed or uh, 
uh, in favor or abstained. And we'll give Abby a few minutes to capture the results of each of those. Um, oh, and Craig has caught us before we move on to approving the, the minutes of the 2019 AGM. We can approve the agenda of this 2020 AGM. Uh, so I will take that as Craig's motion to approve the minutes of the 2020 AGM and call for someone to second. So we're on approval of the agenda and I need someone to raise their hand. Ken Zwicker has seconded. So all those in favor, if you can use the thumbs up icon right now, feel a little like an auctioneer, just a slow one. Okay, and if you can maybe use the hands clapping symbol if you are opposed, just to differentiate it. And also the hands clapping symbol if you would like to abstain. So for my quick look at everyone's screens, we have approved a motion to accept the 2020 AGM agenda. And we also can move right into our next motion, which is to approve the 2019 minutes as presented. And that motion was made by Craig Fancy. So I need someone to second. So if someone can type in to the chat box, that's the easiest way to keep track. So Jane Barker has seconded. Uh, so all those in favor of approval of the 2019 AGM minutes as presented, if you can use the thumb up, thumb, sorry, thumbs up symbol. <laughs> uh, any opposed, use the clapping hand symbol. Any opposition and anyone abstaining can also use that clapping hand symbol. Okay, great. It looks like we have uh, passed our motion to approve the 2019 AGM minutes. So we can move into our next segment. Uh, so we would like to welcome and approve the new members of the MCFC who have joined over, uh, I guess that over the over a year at this point because we deferred our AGM a little bit. Uh, so we have Oh, uh, we first have a question. So the thumbs up uh, window, it's in reactions. And so for me, when I'm in full screen on a, on a desktop or a laptop, it's at the bottom next to kind of the record share screen and chat icon. Um, Mary Jane or Jenica, if you have any additional insights into where it might appear if you have a different configuration. So. Oh, maybe not on the browser version. That may be true. So uh, in the case you're not seeing that reaction option, if you want to either type in in favor or opposed or abstained into the chat box, we can also keep track of your responses that way as well. This is the experiment part of things. Um, so if we move back to our new members, uh, they're presented on the screen and I will quickly read through their names. So we were joined this year by Larry Goodwin, Nancy Robinson, the municipality of the county of Annapolis, Nora Peach, Michael Adzich, Dale Prest, Wayne Mullock, Sally Trower, Tom Rogers, Donna Godfrey Conyers, Elizabeth Braid, Jeanne Riordan, Bruce Davey, Gordon Keel, Scott Hubley, Josie Todd, Corey Lavender, Friedrich Meyer, Dave Heffler, Jamie Simpson, Rick Ketchison, Peter Hall, Kurt Wenzel, Abby Lewis, Don Regan, Stefan Sternweiss, Nina Newington, Lynn Farrell, Britt Roscoe, and Gord Day. Um, so would it be possible to get a motion from the floor to approve the acceptance of our new members? Okay, Will has made, moved, and so can we get someone to second? Craig Fancy has seconded. I should be asking for discussion, but these aren't really high discussion items. 
Uh, so we will go right into voting. So if everyone in favor can either use the thumbs up or you can type your response into the chat box. If you don't feel comfortable doing it to the full group, you can send it to Abby. So you'll look for Abby Lewis, A-B-B-Y and send that over to her because she is doing the magic and keeping minutes. Anyone opposed can use the clappy hands. Okay. So I think we have another approved motion to accept our new members. Uh, so with that being said, we will move over into the election of new directors. Uh, before we really get too deep into that, there are two members of the board who are stepping down this year who I wanted to um, take an opportunity to recognize. And that is Jane Barker and Angelica Waldo. Uh, so Angelica has served on the MCFC board since the initiation of the formal pilot project in 2015. And with her formal training and experience in forestry, as well as her commitment to supporting sustainable and ethical forest management, uh, her, her perspective has been really invaluable as we've worked through some pretty dis tough decisions over the years. Uh, and one of the things that I really um, respect Angelica a lot for is that both her passion, but her compassion for both other people uh, and all the living things in the forest really come through in all of her work. And so really wanna thank you her for sharing so much of her time and energy to the community forest over the years. And then our second member um, is Jane Barker. And Jane has really become a pillar of the organization. So she was one of the driving forces behind the formation of the community forest. And she has been involved in its governance since its inception. So even before the interim directors was the real thing, she has been there. Um, Jane's support for the community forest and its vision more broadly has been unwavering as is demonstrated through the countless hours she, she's poured into basically every aspect of, aspect of the organization. I think she's helped on every committee, every working group and part of any special meeting she was called to and served in basically every position on the executive of the board. Uh, and it's actually hard in a lot of ways to imagine the board without Jane. Um, so I guess, I kind of see her, our ability to let her go as a milestone that's indicated that um, she's done so much work to help us grow to a point that we can function without her, even though for a while we weren't sure if that was gonna be possible. So she stuck it out for, for an extra period of time just to make sure that we were in the right place to see the MCFC continue to succeed. Um, so we do have a surprise for both Jane and Angelica, but it's not so virtual meeting compatible. Uh, so we'll leave it to your imagination and keep them waiting in anticipation. Uh, but once again, I, I can't thank, and we can't thank as the entire board, uh, Jane and Angelica enough for their service. Uh, so I will, just give me a moment here. I saw a few questions come in. So one was, is Queen's District a member? So maybe that is something that um, Mary Jane might be able to call up an answer for. I can't speak to the full list of members offhand. No, they're not. They're not. So if you're interested, you can be first on the list for this year. Um, I did want to kind of give a little background on the structure of our board as well. This might be a reminder for some people, um, but we, we have a series of seats that we host on the board. And that was done in order to try and ensure that we have broad representation from different stakeholders at any given time. Uh, so we have two seats for each of the, the following interests as we call them. So we have the environmental seats, the economic seats, the social seats. And, and since the inception of the board, we've had two seats open for um, what we call our Aboriginal seats or Aboriginal interests. They've gone unfilled, but there's something we, we strive towards filling and always keep them there. Um, so even though there hasn't been a person in those places, don't want to lose track of how important it is to eventually uh, gain that perspective on our board. 
and then we provide four additional seats for members at large. Uh, we also are joined by an ex officio member that represents the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, and so Jillian has served in that role over the past several years. So for this year, in terms of our kind of returning or reoffering board members, we have Don Kimball. Uh, and then we are hopefully about to welcome in two new nominees, George Townsend and Connor O'Brien. So I am going to let Abby take lead on telling you a little bit more about George and Connor. Sure, I will read you the biographies. George Townsend, uh, first, George is an outdoor enthusiast with a great interest for sustainable and responsible forest management. He has 15 years of experience owning and operating a lumber, a lumber yard, as well as seven years of owning a small logging company. George is seeking out opportunities to add value to our forest products and better utilize some of our local species that are undervalued through the operation of his, of his small lumber mill, Community Lumber, which is based in Nova Scotia. Welcome, George. And next we have Connor O'Brien. Connor is a forest technician and graduate of the College of North uh, Maritime College of Forest Technology. He has been quite fortunate in his young career to have had the opportunity to practice forestry in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Manitoba, and British Columbia so far. Since moving back to Nova Scotia, Connor started his own small forestry consulting company, Rumcash Forest Solutions Inc. With Rumcash, Connor and his team provide a variety of services across the province with a number of different landowners, including Crown Land licensees, private robot owners, and mills. Connor brings a youth perspective and exposure to a variety of different methods and strategies for land management that can help facilitate progressive, out of the box thinking and innovation. Thank you, Abby. Um, so we're really excited to pull Connor and George into the collective mind of the board. Uh, and I think just for the sake of expedience, what we'll I'll ask for is uh, a motion to accept uh, all three nominees, George Townsend, Connor O'Brien, and Don Kimball uh, within a single motion. So if there is someone out there who would be willing to make such a motion, you can add your name or Send us a message in the chat box. Okay, I, C.H. Morton, I apologize, I don't know your name, but <laughs> Abby, if you can get that was moved and we will figure out the first name later. Um, is there someone, oh, thank you, Charlene. And then if there is someone who can second. I have uh, Ken Zwicker seconded, seconded first. Um, if there is any discussion from the floor, we can take that. It's probably easiest if we keep uh, messages into the chat box. So I imagine this is another pretty straightforward one. Uh, so for all those in favor, uh, you can vote by using that thumbs up reaction or adding it into the chat box. Any opposed can use the clappy hands or indicate opposed in the chat box. And similar, anyone abstained can indicate with abstained in the chat box. Okay, I don't see a ton of icons coming up, but Abby, if you've been able to survey them, I'm going to say based on the results I did see that we have another approved motion to accept uh, Connor, George, and um, 
Dawn as members of the board of directors. So thank you and we're really excited to have a few new minds to contribute to the organization. So the final big item on our business agenda is the presentation of the financial report. So I will hand it over to Fritz Friedrich to present our 2019 financials. Hello everybody, I'm Frederick. I'm uh, with the MCFC since last year and I'm the treasurer on the board. And I think we'll get right through it. So I'll present to you the 2019 summary of our financials and we're starting with our assets. Um, our cur current assets of 159,277 divide into a cash of 94,500. Um, accounts receivable of 61,531 and prepaid expenses of 1,176. And you from Nova Scotia work in Woodlands Trust with no interest bearing, no terms of repayment, it's 2,070. On top of that, uh, in assets, we have property and equipment of 10,852. Our liabilities uh, total uh, 165,204. Uh, with the biggest item of deferred revenue of 156,371, which mostly constitutes uh, um, our DNR grants. Um, our shareholders' equity, due to our new members of 2019, uh, raised to $4,925. Next slide, please. Get to our revenue. So my screen probably loading, I still see the asset screen. Can, can you all see the revenue screen yet? Ah, oh, there it is, thank you. Um, so our revenue of uh, $284,619 was uh, divided into income from consulting of $7,880. Uh, Big part of our revenue this uh, to the, in 2019 was the firewood sales of 94,731, as well as uh, grants we received uh, from DNR, as well as our uh, student grants and trail development, and that total $75,026. And the big ticket items always our stumpage tender of $106,317, and we made $665 in workshop revenue. Our <clears throat> direct costs, uh, that is a, usually, it's a fairly long list of, and I'm just naming the, the biggest ones, just uh, of course our uh, salaries to our general manager, as well as our in 2019 two students, um, travel for, for staff, as well as uh, insurance and rentals. Um, in, we, on, on top of that, other income was miscellaneous revenue of $1,111, as well as private land service of 2013. So that totals out to be exactly a zero. With uh, just on the last slide now, you'd see our most direct costs. If you remember, our stumpage was a big ticket item on the income list, but it also it's the biggest ticket item on our, our direct costs where we paying $103,386 in stumpage fees, paying $16,881 in freight or trucking costs for our um, harvest. And the harvesting was costing us uh, $43,675. We paid uh, $5,985 for processing firewood and resale purchases in $1,039. And uh, that is all. Any questions? Can I give a moment in case people are figuring out how to phrase their questions? This is maybe one of the items where there'd be curiosity or discussion. Oh, so uh, Fritz, there's a question. What are resale purchases? That's, um, that's like merchandise, like t-shirts and bags. That yeah. yeah. 
sorry, it says this fairly plainly, but I just want to confirm it. Um, so we paid the crown $103,000 in stumpage fees in 2019. Yes. Okay. And we can look at that in comparison to how much we made in stumpage. Um, so and we that's 106. Yeah. But then the firewood, um, that's our biggest value add, right? So we've, we've made 94,000. Yep. So um, that, is, that is what makes us money, is our, our firewood business. Okay, so we're definitely still open to questions, but I will ask for a motion to accept the 2019 financial statement as presented. I'll make the motion. Oh, thank you. Can that voice say their name? George Townsend. Thank you, George. <laughs> And is there anyone who is willing to second? I have Will Martin seconding. So if there's any further discussion, you can turn on your audio at this point. It's been a pretty quiet meeting or you can type into the chat box. Okay. And so all those in favor, you can use the thumbs up symbol or type it into the chat box. Those opposed, you can type, uh, or you can use the, the clappy hands. And those abstained, you can type in abstained. Okay, I'm seeing thumbs up as I scroll through. Okay, so I think that motion is approved. Uh, and with that, we will go over what's gonna happen next because I don't wanna lose you. Uh, so before we ask for a motion to adjourn the MCFC AGM, I'm gonna let you know, we're gonna take a short break. So Mary Jane, you wanna stick with the 10 minute break? Yeah, I think so. So go to the bathroom, get a drink, do what you wanna do. Uh, we'll meet back in 10 minutes and then we're gonna transition into the uh, Nova Scotia Working Woodlands Trust AGM. So don't log out yet. So with that being said, can I get someone to make a motion to adjourn for our business meeting? You're not, we're not done with you yet. And I think Craig Fancy has made that motion as uh, seems tradition. Uh, so thanks everyone. I see 7 or 6 p.m. So we will resume at 7.16.
Okay, Mary Jane, are you ready to move into round two? Yes, I think so. <laughs> Second time's a charm, right? Um, and Abby, I am the secretary for this organization, so I can assume the secretarial duties for you. You can just sit back and relax. I'm going to make it really difficult for you. <laughs> Thumbs up to everything. All of that. <laughs> All right, great. So we'll get started. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, a couple of years ago, uh, the community forest decided that we were going to take a bit of a different direction um, and specifically with our private woodlot services branch. Previously, we had, had discussions about um, providing management services to private woodlot owners, but that niche has kind of been filled by the new Western Woodlot Services Cooperative. Um, and, and we found through our conversations with woodlot owner and woodlot service organizations that what we were really in need of, of was a land trust that would hold working forest easements within the province. So last year we incorporated the Nova Scotia Working Woodlands Trust. Um, and since then, we've really been kind of slowly and steadily bu building the organization um, to become uh, a charitable body and also to hold um, working forest easements through the Nova Scotia Community Easements Act. So I'll talk a bit further about the stage that we're at now, but just as a disclaimer, we don't have a formal membership outside of the current board of directors. So this is kind of our first AGM um, and moving towards a more formal membership, which membership will be available for free through the website. So we can share details about that following the AGM. So why are we starting this organization? We identified that small private woodlot owners in Nova Scotia are often aging and don't have a clear inheritance strategy. Here we have pictured on the left, one of our board members, George Uhlman, with his grandson um, and a recipient of a Nova Scotia Woodland Owner of the Year. We know that woodlot owners often care about their woodlots. Here we have Dale Prest in the middle, another community forest member who's part of a multi-generational family of woodlot owners in Moose Land, Nova Scotia. And finally, we know that woodlot owners are interested in continuing to receive economic returns from their woodlands. Here we have another MCFC member and former board member, Jim Croker, examining some hemlock logs that came off of his forest um, in a harvest in 2018. So the main challenge here is as private woodlot owners age, there will be a huge intergenerational transfer of lands to their kin. There are a few primary scenarios that will produce challenges um, to this effect. Often, those individuals or the kin who are inheriting the woodlot are displaced from the forest and they seek the highest economic return for the woodland without having a real connection to the land. Often unclaimed income, income falls on the laps of the new owners and they're forced to pay a large portion of, to cut a large portion of the woodlot to help pay for capital gains tax. And also woodlot owners often liquidate their woodlot. They see it as an investment. They see it as some way to pay for their retirement, a vacation, a large purchase. So they don't really have the same value uh, in the woodland or seeing that wood standing. And often this leads to practices associated with liquidation locking. So often, specifically what we see in the Southwest of Nova Scotia is woodlots that are being cut um, border to border uh, with limited consideration of watercourse and wildlife regulations or sustainable practices. We also see a whole lot of subdivision and development. This photo is taken in the Malaga Lake area of Queens County, where we've seen ex extensive subdivisions of lakefront properties, uh, which really frag fragment uh, important habitats and ecosystems that thrive in riparian areas. We also see land conversion. 
specifically in central and eastern parts of the province where lands are convert, converted to agricultural plantations or they're used as loopholes for large scale biomass harvesting. So this is, these are all things we're looking to prevent. So how can we do this? Basically, the solution that we see is working forest easements. They complement traditional conservation focused land trusts, but allow sustainable harvesting of timber and non timber forest products. We're specifically looking to target woodlot owners with properties and that have a stewardship legacy. So they really have that either that multi generation or this real love of the land um, and want to see their woodlands protected in perpetuity. And we see this as a way for the values of the current landowner to be integrated into the easement. So if a woodlot owner never wants to see or never wants to think of the prospect of their woodlot being cut in the future, um, they'd be able to guarantee that that will never happen. So I'm just gonna show a brief video here of initiative in the States through the Na Nature Conservancy. This kind of explains what working forest easements are. In the heavily harvested forests of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, the Nature Conservancy is taking a unique approach to restoring trees by cutting them down. Orange slashes mark the spots where trees will be plucked from the landscape. In the woods surrounding Michigan's big two-hearted watershed, this is not preservation as usual. The relationship between the Nature Conservancy and foresters in Michigan's Upper Peninsula is a very unique one. Most people don't think of the Nature Conservancy as cutting timber. They think of the Nature Conservancy as somebody who's protecting timber. In fact, the Conservancy owns 23,000 acres of commercial timberland in the Upper Peninsula. And recently, it created an easement on 10 times that much land, with logging at the very core of the deal. The easement guarantees that the land will be sustainably logged in perpetuity. Through the partnership that we have and through the work that we're doing on the Two-Hearted River Forest Reserve, we're able to conserve far more acres of forested landscape than we would through any other method. By embracing the idea of working forests and sustainable forestry, we're able to prove that you can have a ecological benefit as well as continuing to provide jobs and timber to the economy. More than 100 years ago, a wood rush in Michigan virtually denuded these woods. In the mid 1800s, these forests were literally cleared to help build a emerging society and culture throughout the Midwest. Those forests grew back and those are the same forests that we're trying to conserve today. They serve to buffer the watersheds and water quality and clean the air, but they're just important to part of the fabric of who the people of the Upper Peninsula are. In recent years, the forests almost disappeared again when investors began to eye the land for intensive logging and development. The Conservancy believed there was a better way to manage this vast acreage by using selective logging to recreate a robust forest similar to what existed before Michigan was first logged. For John Fosgett and his team of timber cruisers, that means walking every inch of the forest, assessing every tree, and deciding what should stay and what should go in the name of healthy, diverse forests and clean, free-flowing rivers. There's hundreds of undeveloped forested lakes and hundreds of miles of pristine rivers and streams left in the Upper Peninsula. As far as watersheds and river systems go, it's probably one of the healthiest. And it creates an environment where people live and work unlike most places in this part of the country. What we're trying to do in partnering with the Nature Conservancy is conserve that way of life and conserve that forested resource for future generations. So that really tells a good story of how 
get back to my presentation here. Maybe. Maybe, yes. Okay. So I really like that to show kind of both um, the type of forest management that we're envisioning for the Working Woodlands Trust, as well as um, just to showcase some of the great initiatives that we're learning from that exist in the Northeast states. Um, it's really been an integral part of uh, learning and developing uh, the processes and policies that, that we'll be implementing with the land trust. So basically, how does it work? Um, a community easement is a binding document that exists between a land trust body and the landowner. It outlines restrictions uh, and or limitations on future, future use of the property that might include for future property development, natural resource extraction, and include details on annual monitoring stewardship. And the key, the key decision here is that easements are tied to the property no matter who owns it. So having a working forest easement attached to a deed enables careful management pl planning that implements ecological forestry practices and then will be implemented in perpetuity. So it's attached to the deed no matter who owns it um, so that you'll never see, um, or you'll never see any sort of violation uh, without direct consequences to that landowner. So if a future landowner were to uh, challenge or uh, complete an infraction that's against the easement, um, they would then be brought to court by the land trust. So this land trust is most commonly a not-for-profit charitable organization focused on the acquisition of land, primarily for conservation. You're likely familiar with some of the existing bodies in Nova Scotia, like the Nova Scotia Nature Trust and the Nature Conservancy of Canada uh, that seek to protect uh, habitat usually specific to species at risk. Um, through some of our conversations with those traditional conservation-focused land trusts, we found that there's often a surplus of woodlands that they cannot or do not have the uh, resources to put under easement um, given their current priorities. There are of course other options for landowners that are really um, dedicated to initiatives such as the Nature Trust. So that might enable uh, land donation and then selling that land in the future to solicit donations. Um, but we really want to kind of help fill that niche that allows uh, a land trust to continue to be managed sustainably um, for generations. So this is also tied um, to acquiring lands as well, acquiring properties. So we'll also take donations of properties that are of special value um, and hold them uh, under easement and actually use them kind of as demonstration community for us uh, to promote uh, the initiative. So this is all tied to the Nova Scotia Community Easement Act, which we're currently in the process of uh, becoming an eligible body to hold community easements. And this was specifically created uh, to fill the void that the Conser Conservation Easement Act uh, couldn't fill. So um, these are uh, purposes that are closer to scenic values, archeological values, agriculture, working forests and wetlands. And it really presents an opportunity to have a diversity of interests uh, reflected in future man land management. So we see this as an opportunity to help rural communities by building long-term economic assets, specifically through uh, woodland conservation and the growth of higher quality timber stands for generation. We also see it as a way to promote landscape connectivity. Right now, there's currently limited mechanisms to um, integrate the working landscape into landscape connectivity, specifically related to private lands. Uh, so this is a real opportunity to educate the public on species at risk and um, showcasing that uh, conservation and forest management don't necessarily have to be in complete juxtaposition with each other. We also see this as a future potential to 
sell carbon credits. Um, having a land under easement creates increased um, verifiability and assurance for an organization that's uh, purchasing carbon offsets. Um, so we see this as an opportunity to create a new aggregated um, carbon market that potentially could be tied to the Medway Community Forest License Area as well. So our mission is to uphold the long-term stewardship of working woodlands in Nova Scotia through ecological forestry and conservation. We're working to become a charitable, charitable society. We're actually in the final stages of obtaining charitable registration, um, which unfortunately we initially declined earlier this year, but now uh, we've gotten CRA to come around and see uh, the benefits of this project that is a little bit outside of the box of traditional conservation focused um, environmental initiatives, but we've been able to prove the real value um, on a landscape level. So how does this work? Um, there are many steps involved and in the past, if you've ever seen any of my other presentations on this concept, I've kind of gone into detail on endowments and payment calculations and all that stuff. And I'm not going to do that today. I think it's, I think I've overwhelmed some people with, with that in, information. So basically what we're doing here is we're appealing to the willing. Um, and if a landowner is best suited to proceed with a conservation based land trust, including the nature trust, uh, NSCC or a new uh, Mi'kmaq land trust that's actually being developed um, under the umbrella of the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, we're going to direct them that direction. This is really about working in partnership with existing organizations as well. So if the landowner wants to continue to own their land, they'll go under a property evaluation and appraisal by Nova Scotia Working with Lands Trust staff or necessary contractors. From there, we develop an endowment. Um, so an endowment is really to help pay for the stewardship and monitoring that's gonna have to occur on that woodlot on an annual basis, as well as um, help provide security for any future violations of the easement. So in case we have to go to court to defend the easement, there's money in the endowment to help pay for that. Um, we are then able to issue a charitable receipt, which often helps the woodlot owner pay for that endowment and we collect uh, baseline data and complete a management plan if the woodlot owner does not already have one with a regional woodlot service provider. We then draft the easement and then we have our ongoing annual monitoring and stewardship that occurs in an annual basis. This is a very simplified version of what everything is going to happen but provides a bit of an overview on how the process actually works. Um, in terms of selling or donating the land, it's much more streamlined in terms of providing a charitable receipt. Um, and then we are able to facilitate the ongoing management um, within the organization or with a regional service provider. So to speak a bit more about the endowment, it of course includes those annual monitoring talk costs and then those liability costs. So negotiations and legal defense primarily. And we also calculate risk based on the likelihood of infraction. We can put this into an endowment cost calculator that we've actually copied from um, a land trust that's been that that's existed for over 75 years in um, New England, the New England Forestry Foundation which calculates an average endowment at about 70 to $150 an acre. So that's not necessarily what the woodlot owner is gonna pay every time, um, but it uh, provides a good ballpark figure of what we're thinking about. Ultimately, this is not an insignificant investment for many woodlot owners, um, but we really need to show the value of the fact that this land will be preserved in perpetuity. Um, and we're really working right now on showcasing, working on storytelling to figure out how to best um, share that messaging. So I mentioned earlier that we're working with various partners, uh, specifically regional woodlot service providers. Um, Western Woodlot Services Cooperative has been a key member in the development 
of the NSWWT, and we hope that we continue to have their presence on the board in the future. Um, we've also had support from the provincial woodlot owner organizations, the Federation of Nova Scotia Woodlot Owners and the Nova Scotia Working Woodlot Owners and Operators Association, as well as North Nova Forest Management and various other um, private woodlot management organizations such as Conform and um, the Cape Breton Private Lands Partnership, uh, as well as Athol Forestry. So we're trying to get all of our bases covered throughout the province so that we're not sending staff to Cape Breton at an exorbitant cost to do annual monitoring. We have these partner organizations that will work together with us um, to pro provide those services. And in exchange, we're able to pay them. So we're able to do well for their business as well. So a key component that these service providers uh, will be supplementing with the easement is a management plan. So often when we're talking about tying to these management service groups, a lot of their existing members are interested in working forest easements. So they'll perhaps already have a management plan that is relatively aligned with what the NSWWT is looking to promote. So typically these are written on a 20 year management cycle and updated every 10 years. And that will be our intent um, with every management tent plan that's completed for our easements. Um, and we will allow the landowners to outline specific requests for ongoing permanent conservation or trail maintenance or whatever it may be. Um, and then of course we have the mechanism um, and ability to monitor whether those are being upheld on an annual basis. And of course, full disclosure, when someone owns the property or is changed in the, when the property changes hands that the new landowner will be fully aware that this easement exists um, so that there are no big surprises um, down the line. And hopefully they'd subscribe to our values as well. So I'm going to get Jenica to talk a bit about the next steps um, and our strategic planning going forward uh, this year. She's really working on um, this file very diligently, and I'm very grateful to have her help uh, in making this happen. So Jenica, take it away. All right. Thank you. So yeah, I'll cover a bit of uh, some next steps and, and what we're working on in strategic planning. Um, so as of about a month or two ago, we've um, started working with, um, or we've hired a, a, cons um, a consultant, Josh Nesworthy of Global Conservation Solutions. Um, so starting to work forward with that um, and having some assistance in strategic planning. So it's been broken down into five key programs that I'm gonna give a little bit more detail on. Um, but right now we really are working to lay down that groundwork to launch a pilot easement in the spring. And so we will need community support and likely some volunteer engagement um, for some types of promotional and informational events and various fundraising. So stay tuned for ways that you can get engaged and involved and help um, take this to the next steps. But the first of um, the sort of strategic planning programs is one, the securement of land and property rights. And like Mary Jane mentioned, some of those first steps are securing charitable status, becoming an eligible body under the Community Easement Act, um, and undertaking a high profile land acquisition campaign. The second program um, focuses on long term stewardship and securement of lands. And the next steps for that are to host management planning meetings with Woodlot Service Partners the development of easement templates and criteria for site selection and site selection screening processes, as well as developing partner agreements with those service providers. The third part uh, in the strategic planning is really focused on fundraising, and that's developing a long-term strategic plan for fundraising through various avenues of um, grants and gifts planning and outreach activities. So working forward to develop a profile and relationship and relationships with the charitable philanthropic community. 
as well as launching a fundraising campaign for land acquisition and endowments. And that fourth category there, uh, outreach and public awareness. So developing a strong and effective public image, creating communications and brochures and different promotional materials. Um, also working to develop and a targeted marketing plan that addresses our, our vision and mission and um, various services and resources needed. And the fifth there, the capacity building, uh, working to continue to liaise and develop relationships with various charitable, federal, provincial, and local land conservation groups and ENGO communities, um, as well as to develop a quarterly work plan um, with performance measures uh, to obtain um, board review and approval over time. So um, it'll be a very busy winter and sort of flushing out some of these ideas and, and really prepping for um, an easement launch and sort of a good um, outline of how this makes sense and how this works on the land. And once we have a pilot uh, operational and in place to sort of begin touring and, and uh, inviting other people to see uh, and walk the landscape and see how it actually works. Great, thanks Danica. Mm -hmm. So on to questions, if there are any. Jenica, did any questions come in? There's none in the chat that I'm seeing. But if people want to write in the chat box, go ahead. Or if you want to unmute yourself, and I think we have some time to chat. Um, Craig <laughs> wants to fundraise right now. <laughs> I think how, not now. <laughs> no, right now. <laughs> Those are good questions. Um, that is to be determined. Um, various avenues for fundraising um, through memberships. Um, I guess the main means right now um, is through that endowment um, and legacy gifts as well. People have the opportunity to, to pass off their land. A key part of us working with a strategic planner and a consultant is that we're hoping to identify a revenue stream. Um, so whether it be through carbon offset sales or through sales of timber on a uh, land trust owned properties, we think it's really vital um, in order for this to be successful that we have revenue streams um, established. So if you have any ideas of things we can do, we're open. <laughs> Taking suggestions. Um, Jane is asking what are timelines for the next steps? Um, so most of those sort of things that I've listed off there um, are through the next 12 months. Um, and obviously in working with our consultants, a lot of the strategic planning is sort of seeing out the five year horizon, 10 year horizon, so that we're setting ourselves up quite sustainably and looking for that economic self-sufficiency. Um, but the list that I kind of went through there covers more of the, the plans for the year. I think operationally, um, by the end of the year, we're hoping that we'll have obtained charitable status as well as become an eligible body under the Community Easements Act. And part of what tonight's for as well as it's to pass our bylaws in order to do so. Um, and then into next year, um, we're hoping to be able to have a pilot easement project and kind of like a champion or a couple champion woodlot owners um, that we'll be able to use as a demonstration. Um, so there is a certain reluctancy to what for woodlot owners to sign on to things before they really know how it looks on the ground. So we want to make sure that no one gets cold feet um, and that we're really able to showcase all of the work that we've done to initiate this project. Um, and so we think that that, that pilot easement is going to be really vital um, to establishing that trust. So another question, um, Ken says, um, perpetuity is a long time. Could a land trust fail at some point? If so, what happens to the easements? Great question. Um, within the bylaws, um, 
there is a winding up policy, um, which in which case uh, the easements as well as the endowments would go to an organization with similar values. So um, whether that be the Nature Trust, um, you know, if, if we had a significant volume of property as well as money in the bank for endowments, I'm not speaking for them right now, but there's a likelihood they would be able to take those on. Um, very specifically tied to if we have adequate endowments. And and it's worth sharing that um, the New Brunswick Community Land Trust, which is an organization with similar values um, and was operating for about 20 years, is folding. Um, and they, were, they approached us if we wanted to take on some of their land assets in New Brunswick. Um, and we're able to learn from that organization. Um, specifically, they were not taking uh, endowments, uh, so they didn't have any money in the bank uh, when it came to staffing costs. So once the, the volunteer exhaustion or fatigue let in, um, it, it, it was challenging for them to keep going. So I think we're really trying to be aware of the, you know, not, not to put it so negatively, but the failures of others and how we can learn from other organizations and, and make sure that we're, we're successful in this project. And I have another question. Um, David's asking, how complicated is it now for a woodlot owner to get a working forest easement? Where would he or she start? Well, there's no body that exists right now um, to hold that easement for you. So that's why we're establishing this organization. So in order to build or create a working forest easement, you need to have a land trust body to hold that easement. So you need to have a third party uh, in order to do so. So that's that's really what we're, the key to what we're doing here is we're creating the body so that woodlot owners have the option to uh, place their, their forests under working forest conservation easements. Mm -hmm. All right, and Donna says carbon offsets are very exciting just an aside. <laughs> and Craig is asking, do we have woodlots in mind? Are any owners stepping up that we know of? Yeah, we have quite a few um, in mind and quite a few have stepped up who are interested. And in, um, if you're interested, by all means, get in touch with us um, because the more the merrier right now um, and the you know, the, the more we can show where we have interest um, for this initiative, I think the more, um, at least in the short term, and able to like show, showcase to funders and um, facilitate effective fundraising, uh, being able to show that there's a lot of buy-in to this is really essential. So share it, share it with your friends, let them know. Um, and we will kind of be doing more of a formal launch in terms of marketing and developing our brand and sharing it through social media or through, you know, even mail outs, we're talking about aging woodlot owners here. Um, we'll be doing that more so next year and that'll be another product of the strategic planning. And with that being said, there are a few woodlot owners that have spoken out with the interest of sort of taking on pilots. Is there two or three that have really sort of committed to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this seems like a critical way of moving private land ownership towards ecological forestry. What interest is there from the province? Well, as I think I mentioned in um, the community forest presentation is this is one of the deliverables from our current funding agreement. Um, so the province is interested in this because they have a very limited limited capacity in influencing how ecological forestry pans out on private land. Um, that said, we we aren't going to be tied to, we, we're not planning to be tied to department funding in the long term. We really see this organization, um, we really see that it needs to be independent of, um, of government priorities. Um, so not to say that we wouldn't 
be able to help facilitate um, some outreach, but there's are already so many organizations that are doing that in Nova Scotia that we don't want to compete um, and that we want to kind of stay independent. So, um, you know, we're able to be a bit more vocal about issues of conservation specifically um, than we would be wearing our hats over at the community forest. And there's another question. Um, can you please speak to how local Indigenous communities have or will be consulted as a part of this initiative? So our primary um, means of communication currently with uh, Indigenous communities is through our partners um, at the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. Um, and we've been in conversation with them about building uh, this Mi'kmaq land trust um, and how we can best facilitate um, or help promote cross partnership or where there's woodlot owners that have, you know, asking that question initially, if there's an interest um, for woodlot owners to specifically uh, donate their property or put their property under easement for indigenous use um, and kind of sending them over to that new land trust entity. Um, so we're not aiming to compete um, with those organizations and that we wanna make sure that they're able to access um, any sort of land holdings that are possible um, through, through an easement. Great. Um, so many questions, this is good. Um, Jane did um, make a point just to say that regards to the support from um, the province. She wasn't really specifically asking for in regards to a funding perspective, but just as a way of promoting it and just sort of encouraging. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're generally um, for the initiative. Yeah. And Dan says we have hundreds of thousands of acres in land trusts here in Alberta. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm digging. I'm like, where is there a question in here? Yeah, so Will just says, seems like a key stage to build our relationship with the Land Trust Alliance in the US. Many members with significant experience with working forest easements. If we could become an affiliate member with the LTA, we gain access to the resource library, including government's legal templates to use. Um, they've also created an insurance mechanism to lower the cost to defend, defend easements over the long term. But I think in regards to questions, I think I've got everyone covered. Great. Unless anyone has any last minute ones or wants to unmute to say anything. My email and phone number are here. If you have any questions that you don't want to ask the wider group, but you're interested in learning more, please reach out to me or Jenica. Mm -hmm. So one more question did pop up here. Um, is this program necessary for the MCFC to continue? No, though so it is some kind of a contingency plan. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's um, if the MCFC, not saying this would happen, but if we weren't able to negotiate the structure that we need in order to be self-sufficient and we were forced to fold, um, this would be a way to kind of transfer our resources over to a different organization. Not saying this. We've got three more years of, of making things happen. <laughs> Try our hardest, yeah. Perfect, well, I think that's all we've got here for questions now, so. All right, I'm gonna take off to the business meeting. Apologies about the wrong date. That was when our meeting was supposed to be held. Um, so we don't have a whole lot to cover here um, because this is our first annual general meeting. Um, and I'm not good at the format. Like, Katie, do you want to do this? I'm not, I don't know the Roberts rules very well. 
Are we officially nominating our slate of board of directors? Yeah, we're gonna officially nominate. Um, oh yeah, you're the secretary too. Well, I guess this knows this fits because you know what to write down. <laughs> um, so we're we're transferring from an interim board of directors to a formal board of directors, basically. Um, so I can just read off. Uh, our current board of directors um, consists of Don Kimball. He's our current chair. He's a woodlot owner based in South Brookfield. Uh, Katie McLean, who you all know well by now. Um, myself uh, as executive director and officer, and I'm also acting treasurer since we don't have one. And Jim Croker, who's another woodlot owner also in South Brookfield. So maybe we want to diversify and get some other woodlot owners on the board. If you're interested, please let me know. Unfortunately, again, we'll have Jane Barker stepping down, um, but filling her role from MTRI will be Colin Gray. We will also have Patrick Wigan, who's the executive director at the Federation of Nova Scotia Woodlot Owners, and Donna Crosland, who's a forest ecologist and does a whole lot of um, more activist uh, type activities within the province, um, specifically with the Healthy Forest Coalition, among others. Um, so we were also in conversation with several private woodlot owner representatives from a, inside and outside Southwest Nova Scotia. We realized that our board right now is fairly heavy to the Southwest. And we think that that representation um, geographically is really needed if we wanna make this successful. So hopefully those nominees will come through. Um, and then we're also open and seeking nominees with legal and or accounting experience. So if you are, or if you know a lawyer or an accountant who might be interested in this initiative, um, please send them our way uh, because it's, it's a really, if you see all of the successful land trusts in the States, um, they always have someone with legal or accounting um, expertise on their board. So it's really something that we see as being a vital part of our future success. So should we, and, and I guess it's worth noting our only voting members right now are our five board members. Um, so uh, I guess we make a motion to accept the new nominees to the board of directors. I can move that because it has to be one of your existing board members to do it. And I'll second it. And next, we do have financial statement from 2019. We spent some money on the creation of our beautiful logo. Uh, and then we paid some business taxes, license and memberships and professional fees um, specifically associated to um, subscribing to some channels such as the Land Trust Alliance as an affiliate member, um, as well as the Ontario Land Trust Alliance um, to tap into some of those resources that um, are really essential and, and I think it's, it's important we're not reinventing the wheel here. There's a lot of um, great successful interest that we've been able to tap into. Um, and, and worth noting too is the land trust currently doesn't have any accounts. It's being funded fully through the Medway Community Forest Cooperative. Um, it is in our goals for strategic planning that we've become financially independent from the MCFC within the next year. Um, so Hopefully that comes with getting some funding um, for uh, specifically, we've applied for some funding to the Forest Innovation Transition Trust, um, which is administered the Department of Natural of Lands and Forestry, sorry. Um, that's to help pay for our consultant as well as some marketing expenses and staff fees associated with um, developing those that strategic plan. Um, and then from there, hopefully that'll yield um, kind of more of our fundraising avenues going forward. And of course our revenue streams. Are there any questions on the financials? Nope. 
Can I have a motion? I can do that, I think. I was like, she's typing. She's good. <laughs> well, the treasurer should make the motion, right? Right. Okay. That's me. Um, I'll make the motion to pass the uh, 2019 financial report. Okay. Thanks, Don. Yep. I'm usually just sitting here, not doing anything. So, <laughs> weird. I'm in a role. And I will second. Great. And our final item is approval of our bylaws. Um, so we're currently operating under the template bylaws that um, are provided by the Nova Scotia Registry of Joint Stocks for societies. Um, but we have developed bylaws independently, um, which were reviewed. Uh, we hired Juniper Law, uh, specifically Jamie Simpson, to help us review and, and work out any kink, kinks within that. And we must pass these bylaws in order to become an eligible body under the Nova Scotia Community Easements Act because the template bylaws are too general um, to become an eligible body. So the bylaws have been distributed to the board in 2019. And for anyone who's keenly listening and would like to read those bylaws, once they are passed, we will post them to uh, the Nova Scotia Working Woodlands Trust website. So I'll ask for a motion to approve the bylaws. I can do that. And I can second. Okay. And I'll just um, interrupt for a second. Um, Craig asked sort of more regarding to the finances if then CFC will be reimbursed. No, I don't believe so at this point. Because it's seen as really like we're incubating a project that's within our current scope as the community forest because we've always had that intent to provide private woodlot services. Um, so although we want to be financially independent in the future, I don't think um, there's any need to reimburse MCFC. I mean, there's been significant staff costs that have gone into <laughs> developing this as well. Um, yeah, so I think in order for the organization to be successful from the get-go, uh, we need to be keeping things thin. Yeah, I think the way you started, Mary Jane, is the best way to think about it. Right now, we're still kind of a project under the MCFC, but steps like this, like introducing bylaws, are, are going to lead us to our independence in the future, mm -hmm. at which point there may be a different financial relationship between the organizations. So, we definitely have time for another few questions if there are any out there. Um, if not, again, feel free to visit the website. Um, we It's pretty bare bones right now, but it's pretty and uh, shows kind of the intent of where we want to go with the organization. And following this meeting, it'll give us a bit of ability to formalize things. Um, more and probably share profiles of our board of directors. Um, and by all means, reach out to me if you are interested in joining the board of directors or you think you know someone who might be who has kind of some of the specific skills that we're looking for. Um, I think a lot of this being successful is is the commitment of <coughs> board members from the get go, as has been the case uh, with the community for us. So grateful for those individuals. And similarly, if there's anyone who's interested in maybe future board participation in the community forest uh, or our committees have been a little less active over the past year, but we are hoping to revive a few and even launch a new committee um, related to research. You don't have to be a board member to participate on those committees. Um, so just we're always interested in knowing who might be interested in contributing to our efforts. So please reach out to us. And it seems with that, 
Um, thank you, Jenica and Mary Jane and everyone else for joining us. And that might be a wrap. Stay tuned for those dates for the campground consultation and hopefully we can all gather outside soon. Yeah, if all of okay. and I stay together in the woods, hopefully. We'll just choose one where there's less risk of firearms. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know the new date yet, Craig, but we're thinking the weekend after if that works for enough board members. November 15th, I believe. All right, thank you everyone. Again, thanks for donating your evening to us. <laughs> Bye everyone, have a good night. Bye.